Um, and it doesn't matter whether the noise is analog, whether the signal is analog or digital. Noise is going to be somewhere around. So if we can actually get a way to reduce noise, it means a better um, quality output signal based on what you had inputted mm -hmm. or on the input of, of a system. The thing is, the specific ways to design these filters and their specific... Uh, you're, no one, I can tell you this, I mean, I shared this with you guys who are trying to know, there's no one who really go about unless you're really deep and steep in doing um, design from scratch. No one actually designed filters and these filters from the whole mathematics anymore. We have software that helps us to do that now. That's why we have MATLAB and Simulink, to name a few. There's Raspberry Pi that has a C++ and also type of system that help us in terms of how to go about design. So really and truly, it's, 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 it's really what you want and and sometimes doing some experiment uh, through plug and play. So today, what I've posted is really to see and to help you guys see how it is that you actually can design these filters, moving from the realm of the mathematics that you have been exposed to the last time we met. It's important because it's, un it's, it's really important to understand how um, as engineers, as engineering students, how it is that we actually can um, mathematically design filters. But it's even more important, or well, I won't say important, more important, but it's more efficient to actually show how it is that we can actually do real design and implementation of these digital filters. And that's where the software aspect comes in and, 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 and understanding how it is that you can actually utilize the software such as MATLAB or Simulink or Simulink to actually design these filters and the, how then you can apply the, the, the filters to a circuit to provide that filtering or producing that monster called noise. And, and therefore, the posted videos um, I'm showing you how it is that you can go about. And last time I asked, and I think everybody said that they all do have um, MATLAB or access to. And be that as it may, if you do, you can always go onto the system, play around in it, and to see how we can actually do the, the design. As a, as a matter of fact, the next the next filters, um, specific filters using MATLAB. All right, so for those who are here, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and welcome. Good afternoon, sir. Um, yeah, I was just having a little chat, housekeeping with Andrea. Just talking that, talking to you know, that there are two videos that are posted, which um, a deliberate did done in order to try and help you guys understand a little bit more about the two types of filter that we touch, digital filter that we touch. Uh, infinite impulse response filter. Yes, Matthew? Uh, yes, sir. Um, quick question. Going forward, will we be using MATLAB uh, as opposed to um, the mathematical uh, approach? 
in doing filter design, you'll be using MATLAB. Understanding, okay. how, to, understanding how to get, for example, your coefficient and how to design from scratch. That was a mathematical approach that we did. So it really shows you how it is. So for example, um, our filters will have poles and zeros. So you really want to know how it is that you can actually design a particular type of filter from a mathematical standpoint. But in um, your design for execution, let's say you're doing a project or you're doing real world things, because of the fact that you have engineering software that to help us, we need to understand how to implement these things using these engineering tools. So it's like um, someone knowing that you can get to legally from Papin. The, the objective is to get to Ligani from Papin. We know that there are different ways we can do that. The whole, the whole aspect of engineering, creating tools and equipment gives us some advantage if we utilize these things. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should not know the route to get there in the best or most efficient way. So you could walk, ride, drive, or you, you name it. But if the aim is to get from a puppy into a ligony, that's just the final outcome that you want to achieve. How you get there? You can use the, utilize the resources that you have, the best resources. So as engineers, one of the things that you like to do is to do, utilize um, best practices and efficiency in doing things. It doesn't mean that, again, as I said, you should not know because you might be getting things that you need to know how to design these things from first principle. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Good. Um, we only have 13 or so people. Let's see if we wait for a couple more. Um, okay. In the interim, are there any questions that you guys have that are, um, you see answers for at this time? I don't know, somebody seemed to, I, it doesn't matter with this class, I never seem to have for the chat. I never seem to have hosting right. Somebody has the hosting privilege. Okay. I have no idea who it has, but I definitely it's probably Chad, sir. Do not. Nah, uh, well, I don't feel. I don't feel. Uh, Uh, what I wanted, why I asked is because I wanted for whoever has that right to actually um, present the video. Is that or that? Or I can give you, I know the first one is just about 20 minutes. I can give you guys all the time to watch the video and then we jump right back. You give me a thumbs up or raise a hand when you are finished watching 
the video. I think that is probably a little bit more efficient since I'm not sure who has the the hosting right. It looks like I'm easy, sir. Is that okay? Oh, Andre, you're presenting. Okay. You look like you have it, Andre. Oh, look like I mean. Oh, what did me? What did me? Can I share? See, not the first person who comes into the class is the person who does have it. I don't know. Do, do you have um the ability to record to Andre? No, sir. As I'm saying, sir, because I can share a screen as well, so I don't. I don't think that's what dictates the um the host rights. Yeah. Can anyone who right. is currently okay. here uh, record? Um. Chad. Yo, yo. Share the, share the, the video, sir, just for us. Weren't you doing that just a while ago? Oh, you, you guys were seeing it? Yeah. yeah. All right. Do it again. Yeah. Close this. You guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. All right, everybody see an Andre screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, all right, Andre, let's roll. And um, as I said, guys, if you have any questions, we can keep it to the end or make notes of it, or you can raise your hand while we're watching it and I'll acknowledge. So go ahead, Andre, I'll mute my microphone just in order not to create a feedback. I hear the audio. No audio, Andre. We're not hearing the audio. So nobody is hearing it. No, I'm so not hearing. You not hear it? Audio as well. Welcome. Uh, no, sir. Still not hearing. What yeah? No, 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 no. We understand it because may I play it, play it out loud. We'll see if we can find share audio. I think we don't think um, the audio is being shared. We'll share entire screen. Stop sharing. Share. Please don't your entire screen. Share a window. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, see a screen now? Yeah. 
Yeah, I hear you. How do you? Yeah, that's a... Oh, that's not that Is that how you're hearing the video? Not here, no, no, no order from you. Um, sure, Charlie, we'll we'll try you to share it and see if we hear. I mean, once you share the video, I'm, I'm not sure unless unless your microphone. But you try, you try, channel, Let's see. Um, Is that my phone doing the work? I'm trying. Hold on. Wait, that's your answer. Well, I'm going to try again, Chad. Yeah, I'm going to try again now. No, I'm not here. Don't know where I'm going. Nobody else share it then. That's right, that's it. You're in the top instead. I'm basically. Oh. Yeah, you have two ways that you're presenting. Your what? presentation. Yeah, and then it's like um, top instead. Okay. Motivation as to why we decided to do this video in the first place. Yeah, right here, no. um, following which, Mark's going to do. Huh? Yeah, right here. No. All right, cool. Put a little bit of background on on, on, on filter design and go. go into the into the math involved with it and then we're going to do a software demonstration he's going to show us how to design a filter and then implement it in 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 matlab and simulink and, and we're, we're going to use the filter design tool for this um and then finally we're going to do some key takeaways and resources to help you guys do better at your competitions so starting with the motivation um, um marine robotics student competitions involve a lot of signal processing um, especially especially um, uh, in the hydrophone task at rumination competitions like roboboat and robo sub and robot x uh, but before getting into you know in, in, into time direction of arrival and, and and all that kind of stuff you you need to start small and you need to start with with, with filter design by the way we do have a a, a video on 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 finding the direction of arrival of the signal um, in MATLAB in the robotics arena. So you might want to take a look at that. Um, so without further ado, I'm, I'm going to hand it over to, to Mark and have him and have him um, and have him get into in the MATLAB and, and do some, some background and, and take it away. Okay. So, so for Mark. before we get into the meat of this topic, I'm going to go over a little bit of background just to cover the basic mathematics behind filter design. So when working with filters, we're working with linear time invariant systems, and we have an input signal that's passed through the LTI system that contains an impulse or transfer function, and then we receive an output signal. In time, the process that's being computed in the LTI system is called convolution, and this is denoted by the first equation. Yeah, convolution's not easy. <laughs> As you can see, yeah, the, con the equation's quite complicated. Uh, this definitely isn't ideal. Um, so. A uh, common practice in signal processing is to convert everything into the frequency domain. And what this does is this converts the convolution process into multiplication, which is much simpler. So uh, just to stop it, uh, how do you convert a signal from, from, the, uh, from the time domain to the frequency domain? Um, to convert a signal to the frequency domain, we use the Fourier transform. Okay. And okay. in the software demonstration, I'll talk a little bit about the tools okay. uh, that MATLAB and MathWorks products provide to okay. support this workflow. Cool. Okay. So let's take a look at some of the fundamental filters. Perhaps the two most basic filters are the low pass and the high pass filter. As implied by the name, the purpose of the low pass filter is to preserve low frequency components and to attenuate or remove high frequency noise or unwanted high frequency components. Conversely, the high pass filter preserves high frequency components and attenuates low frequency components. It's pretty simple. Two slightly more complicated filters would be the band pass and the band stop filter. 
The purpose of the bandpass filter is to preserve frequency components within a specific frequency range. Okay. And then conversely, the bandsaw filter attenuates frequency components within a specific range. Okay. So so, that, so 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 these are all pretty simple, pretty common filters in 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 digital signal processing, right? Correct. These are considered ideal filters. So oh, okay. typically, okay. when we have ideal filters, um, they're not the best choice for application. Okay. Um, they're more for analysis mm -hmm. and and theory <laughs> and theory yeah they're more for okay. analysis and theory okay um so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into the software demonstration all right. all right so the data that i chose to use here is actually data recorded from a submarine ping sensor um from one of the robotics competitions okay all right so let's go ahead and load in this data real quick so in the workspace you can see what i'm loading in why denotes the data that's Y denotes the data that was recorded from the ping sensors, and T denotes a time vector, and then noise is the noise that we're going to add to the signal to filter out, and then duration is just the time of the signal. And, and just to clarify, this noise is something that, that, you're, that you're adding in just for the purpose of the demonstration, right? Yeah, for the purpose of the demonstration, I had a pretty much, I generated a random number generator that creates random noise. Okay. So okay. there's the uncertainty involved, yeah. and yeah. we're going to talk and in real world, you, you, it's hard to predict the noise that's going to happen. Yeah. So this is supposed to mimic a okay. real world application. Okay, okay. cool. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the recorded data in time. As you can see, there's three distinct pings that the hydrophone has the task of identifying. Correct. So next, we're going to add the noise that I mentioned to the signal and then compare the original signal in time with the noisy signal. Oh yeah, I, I, I cannot recognize the signal anymore. It's just it's just random noise at this point. Yeah, so as you mentioned, the signal is almost indecipherable. There's a little bit of correlation, but even where they look slightly similar, um, there is an amplitude offset. Correct. So apart from converting convolution to multiplication, analyzing signals in the frequency domain is also beneficial because it can make plots like this a little more clear. So let's go ahead and convert the signal to the frequency domain, as I mentioned before, and see if we can get a better idea of how we can filter out some of this noise. It, it, just for you to do that, this, this FFT function, is, is, is that the Fourier fast transform that you were talking about that converts, uh, uh, you know, converts signals from time to frequency domain? Yeah, okay. in MATLAB, FFT denotes the fast Fourier transform and will complete the task of converting the signals to the frequency domain for us. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and convert both the original signal and the noisy signal into the frequency domain. And then take a look at the two so we can compare. As you can see, analyzing the signal in the frequency domain gives us a really good idea of the significant frequency components from the original signal and where the noise is present. The pulses that we can see around 50 kilohertz and 125 kilohertz um, are the two main frequency components of the original signal. And then the bands of dense frequency components would uh, denote the noise. You may be wondering why there's two distinct bands where the noise are present. In robotics competitions, there are pretty common there are pretty common sources of noise. One obstacle that many competitors face is the noise generated by the motor of their own robots often distorts their information. Correct. Yeah. And this would be denoted by the low frequency noise that lies within the audible range of 22,000 kilohertz. Correct. And then the high frequency noise could be denoted by other robot so sonar or other extraneous factors. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into designing a filter and open the filter designer tool. The filter designer tool allows you to design filters uh, via radio boxes, drop-down menus, and text boxes, and all of these lie within specific components um, like the res the response type, the design method, the filter order, frequency specifications, etc. Okay, and and it, just going back to when we were talking about the background, you know, I can see it's got the low pass, high pass, band pass, and band stop. So, so yeah, we, we, we actually mentioned those those filters earlier in this presentation. Yeah, and in each one of these drop downs, there's slightly more complicated methods to implement the oh, low okay. pass, high pass. Because um, oh, okay. as okay. we mentioned, ideal filters are not useful and are not useful in applications. So there's slightly more intelligent okay. filters provided. Okay. Um, also, this tool implements several algorithms, as you can see in the filter order. Uh, the minimum order box is checked. Um, this implements an algorithm that will generate a filter of the minimum order based on your specifications. This tool also provides another feature that allows us to observe several different response types for, for the filter. Some of these response types are the magnitude response, the phase response, group delay, phase delay, impulse response, step response, and the pulse zeros response. 
There are several other options, and if you're interested in learning more about them, I'd recommend looking at the documentation for the filter designer tool. So now let's see if we can go ahead and design a filter to attenuate some of the noise. As I mentioned earlier, our signal is being sampled at 300 kilohertz. So let's go ahead and put that in. And then since we're using a low pass filter, we're going to try to preserve some of the low frequency noise and attenuate out some of the higher frequency noise. So taking a look at the plot of our noisy signal, we can see that there's noise somewhere above 125, 125 kilohertz. So let's go ahead and set the passband to be up to 125 kilohertz. And then in real filter application, square waves are not practical because the filter needs some time to drop down to the stop band. So we're going to need to give the filter a little bit of space to reach the stop band. So let's give it around 2.5 kilohertz and set this at 127.5 kilohertz. Okay. And then we'll design our filter. Okay, so this, this looks like a great filter. Um, now that we have the filter, you may be wondering, how do we actually implement this in MATLAB? The filter designer tool provides the option for us to export the filter as an object to the workspace. To do this, you navigate to the File tab, and then go down to Export. A dialog box will pop up, giving you a few options. For simplicity, we're going to export this as an object. We can go ahead and keep the default name. Now if you go to the MATLAB workspace, you can see we have an HD object. We have an HD filter object. The way to implement this filter is to use the filter function. Um, as I mentioned, we chose to export this as an object for simplicity because then, then the filter function only replies the filter object as an argument and then the signal we're filtering. Okay. And then for analysis, we're going to convert this filtered signal into the frequency domain. Let's compare the original signal in time to our filtered signal in time. So looking at this plot, maybe our choice of filter parameters were not the best, or maybe even our choice of filter was not the best. So let's look at the frequency domain and see where we might have gone wrong. So as you can see, we did a good job of attenuating the high frequency components, um, but almost as expected, we still have that low frequency noise. And then from the, from the plot in time, we see that that noise is still enough to drastically distort the signal. Correct. So let's jump back into the filter designer tool and see if we can do a little bit better. So a low, pass, a low pass filter might not have been the best option because there's low frequency noise that we cannot remove from the noisy signal. So let's see if we can try one of the slightly more complicated filters that we mentioned earlier. So let's take a look at the bandpass filter. Since we were able to attenuate the high frequency noise successfully using the low pass filter, we're going to use the same parameters for the pass band and the stop band on the higher edge of our filter. So let's pull up the frequency plot to see if we can identify parameters that will be successful in attenuating all of the noise. Looking at the noisy signal, we can see that there are significant frequency components from the original signal slightly below 50 kilohertz, and that the noise is within the audible range, so it's probably somewhere less than 22, 000, 22 kilohertz. So let's go ahead and set the stop band to be a little over 22 kilohertz. And again, let's give the filter some time to rise to the pass band. So now we have a filter that looks like it will preserve a specific band. Um, so let's export this to the workspace and see if this yields the desired result. So when exporting variables, if there's a variable of the same name, you're going to want to choose to overwrite the variable or else you will receive an error. So let's export this and then jump back into our code and implement this new filter. All right, so looking at the signal in time, it looks like we did a good job. So let's yeah. go ahead and confirm that by again looking at the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, this looks great. We have all the same significant frequency components from the original signal. But perhaps we could even do a little bit better. So let's go ahead and go back into the filter designer tool and take a look at some of those other analysis options that I mentioned earlier to see if this filter is actually optimal for our workflow. So uh, b before before we move on, what's what's the first place that you'd start when you want to when you want to sort of look at uh, uh, making these filters better? What is the what is the sort of first plot that you go to? So the pull zero plot's a very useful plot okay. because uh, we'll go ahead and take a look at it. I'll describe that a little more. So the pull zero plot, um, as mentioned in the name, provides the pulls and zeros, and this gives an idea of what the filter. Uh, this gives us an idea of what the order of the filter is. 
Okay. As you can see here, there's 304 poles. So that means that the order of filter is 300. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, so that means the order of the filter is 304. Yeah. And for implementation on hardware, that, that would use an unnecessary amount of memory. So let's go ahead and see if we can change our filter a little bit to reduce the order. As you can see, the option for FIR is chosen in the design method. FIR filters are more be are beneficial in the sense that they're theoretically simple. IRs are slightly more complicated, slightly more complicated theoretically, but this provides a better result in terms of filter order. So let's choose the IAR and see if this improves our filter. Oh yeah. Okay. It's 86, yeah. Yeah, so now we see that the filter order is around 172, um, since we have 172 zeros. So this is much better, but this would still utilize a very large amount of memory. So let's see if we can choose another type of IR filter to improve our filter even more. For more information on these types of filter, I'd recommend taking a look at our, our documentation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and choose the elliptic filter as somewhat of an educated guess and then see what this does. So now we can see that the filter order is around the magnitude of 20, which is much, much better than the 304 we started with. Yeah. So um, so b b before we move on, you, you, you did mention hardware implementations. Is there a way that I could uh, I could uh, uh, you know deploy this this filter onto a hardware directly from MATLAB and Simulink? Or do I have to, you know, take these coefficients and then, and then write code for it uh, standalone? Of course, yeah. So you mentioned MATLAB and Simulink. I'm going to go ahead and start with MATLAB. Um, okay. Within the filter designer tool, if you go to the targets pane. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's options to generate, to generate code for code, several yeah. different hardware targets. Okay. Um, there's also, if we go back over to file, the option to generate MATLAB code, and Correct. from there, code generation could be used to implement into filters. Okay. Um, but we can also export to a Simulink model. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm interested to see that this the the, the, the Simulink implementation of it because I I know a lot of our viewers are actually using Simulink. So you want to go ahead and show us how to do that? Sure. sure. Of course. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the Export to Simulink option and then click Realize Model. If no model is currently open, what this option will do is open a blank model with the filter block. Um, but I actually already have a model open that implements a similar workflow to the software demonstration we just covered. Okay. All right, so as you can see, a filter block was added to the to the model I already had open. So before we go, I'm going to so I'm going to go ahead and connect this block, but before we move further, I'll talk a little bit about what this model does. The model reads in an input signal and then a noisy signal and adds the two signals together. Then these signals are passed through a filter and we can observe the output at all three stages through a scope. Coming down from the scope, you can see a transformed subsystem. I'm going to go ahead and click on that and take a little bit of time to discuss what's going on. So the fast Fourier transform is a process that's computed on a vector of information. But Simulink runs on sample time. So if we were to just simply implement the FFT block in Simulink, okay. uh, the the transform would, comp would be computed for each sample time. So we would be taking the transform of scalars rather than vectors. Okay. Okay. So what we do here is we use, first use a zero order hold to ensure that our signal is in this discrete time domain. And then we use a buffer to store the signals into a vector. Into a vector okay. So then we can use the Fourier transform. So then, of course, like we did in MATLAB, we take the Fourier transform and then take the absolute value to um, to analyze the data. And then we use a special vector scope that's set to analyze the data in the frequency domain. Let's take a look at the results of the Simulink model to ensure that they're similar to the MATLAB code. Okay. So first we'll take a look at the signal and time through the scope. So as you can see, it's clear that this is very similar to the signals that we had in MATLAB. So let's jump over to the the four the let's jump over to the signals in the frequency domain and ensure that that's also. So the vector since we have three different vector scopes, there's going to be three different vector plots. Um, the vector scope does not support multiple inputs, so we cannot stack plots like we did in the scope block. Okay. Um, but as you can see, again, the the frequency the signal in the frequency domain also pretty strongly correlates the signals from, from MATLAB. Okay. Cool. If you would like to follow the same workflow without using the MATLAB interface, the Digital Signal Processing Toolbox also has a block used to generate digital filters. Okay. Um, to find this block, let's go ahead and go into the library. Okay. To find this block, navigate to the DSP System Toolbox. 
choose filtering, and then choose filter implementations, and there will be a digital filter design block. So let's go ahead and drag this into the model. To use the digital filter design block, double click on the block and a graphical user interface identical to the one we used in MATLAB will be presented. Okay. And in implementing this block, you do not have to worry about exporting to Simulink. When you click the design filter button, those filter parameters will automatically be uploaded into your Simulink model. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, there's also the option to generate code for hardware in Simulink. To learn more about this, uh, I'd advise taking a look at the documentation. All right, so now let's go ahead and jump back to the presentation to look at some key takeaways. Um, so the filter designer tool allows for an iterative design, and this is beneficial because in competitions, uh, the competitors likely won't know the parameters that they want to use their filter. So they're going to have to use a trial and error approach to really reach the best filter for their robot. Okay. Um, implementation for filter design is available on both MATLAB and Simulink, and hardware implementation is also available on both platforms. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time out to come and share this information with us. Um, uh, before we wrap up with this video, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and point you guys to some resources like we do always. Um, again, we, we, we've got a lot of video, we've got a lot of video content available and a lot more to come. Uh, please write to us and tell us what you think about it. And you can get in touch with us either on our, uh, either at the robotics arena at mathworks.com or on our Facebook group. And then, um, also don't forget about the software offer. We do offer free MATLAB and Simulink with, with around 70 odd products. Um, uh, to student competition teams. So please take advantage of that offer and, and, and you can you can get access to tools like the like the filter design tool and and, and a bunch of other tools. Um, and finally uh, we're also filling up the robotic section of the racing large blocks. And, uh, don't forget to take a look at that as well. Um, and uh, thank you so much for watching another episode of the robotics arena and we hope to see you again. So the topic of the next few lectures is filter design, okay? Sir, I'm to present the next one. Um, not, a, not yet, hold, hold on just a sec. Um, so, what we just saw was a, a very basic but important well, in my view, we are showing you how to implement filters, low pass, high pass filters, by using the different libraries in MATLAB. Also showed you how you can actually manipulate the filter based on your desired outcome to give you um, better design as well as to improve on what exists. The question is, what did you garner or grasp from this presentation? Anybody wants to share? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so basically what I understand from what was shared a while ago was you can use different filters um, to get the desire, to reduce the noise um, using MATLAB. Um, so basically certain, you have to know the values to get, um, in order to get the correct filter or the, the, the in order to get the, the desired um, result. But what I don't understand, sir, how do you know the value to, um, to input to get that filter? Yeah. Okay, that, that is where the first, what we did last week could come um, about. But um, even without looking at what we did last week, what is this? Showing you that, hey, listen, um, what first and foremost is my objective? I want to 
designer filter to do what? What is it that is being affected? Is it the high frequencies of my signal that is most affected by the noise? Is it the low frequency? Is it a band of frequency that I'm trying to reduce or remove? What exactly it is that is being affected most? So that's where we actually start. And then you look at how it is that we can actually implement um, a filter, a particular filter, to overcome that challenge. So let's say that we are having a signal, as was explained in this video. Um, and we found that it's the high frequency it's the high frequency component of that signal that noise affected the most. And we can find that out by just having inputted the frequency itself. Um, into MATLAB, we can see how the frequency behave. We can generate a particular noise, uh, well, noise spectrum. The next one you're going to be seeing is how it actually physically generates some of these quality. That's the next lab that's coming up. And I think that will help to answer your question. But you can actually physically gener generate things like um, AWGN noise, right? Which is noise basically white noise, which is across the entire spectrum of um, the frequency. And then you see how is the signal being most affected? Is it the higher frequency, the lower frequencies? Which part of the is being affected most? And then you can then create a filter and each filter come in different types. You have both the word, you have elliptical, you have trebuchets, you have all different types of filters that also provide their own unique um, characteristics. And these are some things that we'll quickly look at as well in terms of how each one of these provide um, this additional info. But that's kind of what you can do or else You'll be given information to design a particular filter to do certain things. You're given that information. Design a particular filter to do certain things. And that's how the parameters would come in in terms of what do I design. So run the next one. Well, if there's all a question, next one will also provide a, some form of clarification where that is concerned, all right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Any other question? Um, good afternoon, sir. Hi, Miss Michael. Um, in a case where the noise and the signal have similar frequencies, is it possible that the filter will get rid of some other signal? Um, again, it all depends on what you're trying. Noise, the noise and the signal will always have similar frequencies. It's just that the noise will affect the amplitude of a signal more at certain frequencies than, 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 than other frequencies. You following me? Because noise is spread across the spectrum of, of, of uh, the spectrum of frequencies. Okay, so but at certain at certain frequency, the noise will be more impactful okay. than other frequencies, right? Yes, sir. So what you want to do is to see, okay, and, and before I even go there, and it's the amplitude of the of the signal that usually speaks to the intelligibility of a signal, because when you reduce the and when the, the, the amplitude of the signal is that corrupt, it means that the information is not as um, easy, easily deciphered. Okay, sir. All right? So what you want to do is to try and reduce the noise where it is affecting the, frequent, the, the amplitude most. 
Okay, sir. So it could be at low frequency, it could be at high frequency, it could be at mid-band frequency. That's why I look across the spectrum of the frequency of the signal, where it is that noise is affecting it the most. And that's how you then apply a particular filter, low pass, band pass, band stop, high pass filter, based on what the challenge is. So it's not, a, it's not about the frequency. It's, it's more like about the where, where it is that noise is affecting the amplitude of the signal most. All right? Okay, sir. Any other question? If not, let's look at the other um, presentation. So a little bit shorter. Hi, welcome to online tutorial videos from JCB Labs. For more information and to download the source code of this video uh, or the MATLAB code for this video, visit uh, us at www.jcbrolabs.org. Uh, in this particular video, we'll talk about how to design a low pass filter, which is uh, could be IIR, that means finite impulse response filter, or FIR filter in MATLAB. Specific to IR filter, we will be focusing more on Butterworth kind of filter. So, open MATLAB. In MATLAB, first we need to uh, define a signal uh, which needs to be filtered out from the signal. So, first we define a simulated signal. So, prior to it, let's define the sampling frequency frequency of the signal, let's say 5 hertz, and time duration of the signal, let's say we are generating the signal for 5 seconds, and the sample period, uh, that means the time axis, that is 1 by fl to t. So it will create a time axis for that. Now CLC, now let's mm, generate our signal sine 2 pi f let's see how this sinusoid signal looks like so this is our sinusoidal signal of 5 hertz frequency with 50 hertz sampling period uh, 100 hertz sampling period okay now let's uh, add the noise into the signal so our noise is AWG noise, that means additive white Gaussian noise. The good property of this AWG noise is uh, its spectrum uh, has a, or it is known as a white noise because its spectrum lies over the entire frequency range. So, so AWGN x comma let's say one. This is the SNR ratio, and let's now see how the signal looks like. So this was our sinusoidal signal after adding noise into it. So it is quite disturbing or uh, the noise had distorted the most of the properties of the signal. So if we let's say we try to see the uh, Fourier transform or the spectrum of this uh, noisy signal, so let's say have a FFT of it, that is absolute value of FFT of Z. So now the noise, as you know, the sino spectrum sinusoid is two peaks at the frequency, but uh, now all the other uh, ray frequency range are filled with the noise, and the uh, noise is quite high in this case. Okay, so now we will define a filter. First of all, we'll talk about uh, IIR filter and specifically in IIR filter we talk about the Butterworth filter and that's to the low pass filter. So the property of the low pass filter is uh, it uh, uh, passes all the frequency which is up to the cutoff frequency and it stops all the frequency which is outside the cutoff frequency. And the order of the filter determines uh, how sharp uh, there will be a transition from pass band to stop band. So keeping all this in mind and assuming you know the basic theory of the filters, 
Now first define the order of the filter. Let's say we have order of five of IR filter and we need to define the cutoff frequency and that should be in normalized way. That means in omega C. So in making, in order to make uh, the normalized, we need to divide the normal frequency divided by sampling frequency. So if we talk about our cutoff frequency because our signal is of 5 hertz duration. So we should have the cutoff frequency of 10 hertz so that it is well within the range of the passband. If we take the cutoff frequency of 5 hertz only, so our signal whose frequency, uh, who in the signal which we want to uh, filter out is very near to the edge of the cutoff and that may create a problem. So we will take uh, uh, additional uh, 5 hertz band in order to make sure our signal frequency is well within the range of the passband. So let's make it uh, omega c uh, into f by f. So this is the normalized frequency. Uh, so normalized cutoff frequency. We want to it to up to 10. So we'll take 10 by f s. So this is the basic concept of DSP. If you have gone through it, and now we will define a filter. So filter is defined very easily. So it gives the numerator and denominator coefficient uh, terms in b comma a so b is the numerator coefficient and a is the denominator coefficient of the ir transfer function and b u double t e r then o comma w c so this b and a coefficients have been generated so this is the p coefficient of order 5 numerator and these are the denominator coefficient so uh, if we are interested in looking the uh, frequency response of the filter or whether in order to specify whether our design criteria is being met or not so let's say the frequency response of the filter so it will go like this f r e q z b comma a so this is the frequency response of our digital system yeah so it is uh, our frequency was of 10 hertz and so our cutoff is near about 0 0.6 into pi radian per sample and uh, this is a password and this test to just after it it is going uh, up to minus 50 db so there's another tool as well in order to uh, display the frequency response of the filter and that is fv tool and simple b comma a so yeah it also gives the same frequency response so this is near about 0 0.5 uh, was a normalized frequency of the signal and after that there's a uh, decay in the amplitude or uh, amplitude response of the filter. So this particular, uh, after this, this is the stop band and this is a pass band. And so now our frequency response looks fine. So now we can use uh, our filter command. So in order to just make filter, there is a command filter. So let's say we have a signal, filtered signal in x underscore f is equals to filter the coefficients and the signal which we want to filter so we want to filter the z so our signal has been filtered this xf let's see okay so this is our filtered signal uh, which is xf and it is a little bit improvement over the uh, previous one let's clear it and Mm, let's define again with the frequency of um, 5 out of frequency and let's say filter and again now plot x underscore f now it is uh, quite uh, better than the previous one uh, but still the 
uh, amplitude was distorted because the so uh, noise was in a high amplitude so if we uh, go through a uh, script window in which we try to change the amplitude of the signal it is so a noise has been removed uh, by up to a great extent similarly this was the example of the ir filter and that is a butterworth filter similarly we can also design a fir filter so in the case of fir filter let's take same order of order 5 and cut off frequency same uh, we will change as the numerator and denominator coefficient this is known as fir1 and order comma wc so now this is the fir filter and let's say how its frequency response looks like so okay, this is the typical frequency response of a fir filter and of the two one this is the frequency response of the fir uh, now it's uh, uh, not showing a greater improvement than that of the uh, ir filter ir filter seems to be much more than that so let's try to change the order of the filter because generally fir requires higher order than that of the ir filter and do it again now now it is the uh, response is uh, better than that the previous one the one of the benefit why we use fir is uh, due to its phase response because it provides a linear phase response uh, in the filter Uh, filter output so the distortion is minimum in the output signal but in the case of uh, ir filter uh, ir filter doesn't have a linear phase so due to which uh, most of the times uh, output signal gets distorted due to this non linear phase property of the ir filter now let's filter it uh, filter the signal and again x comma f equals to filter uh b comma a comma z and let's see how this signal looks like so again it also has removed the signal okay in order to have uh, some comparison uh, because it maybe looks like signal has not been removed let's subplot 2 comma 1 comma 1 plot z and title noisy signal and then this was our original noisy signal subplot 2 comma 1 comma 2 plot x underscore f and this is filtered signal and now i have a look uh, this was our noisy signal and this is our filtered signal so it is quite clear like Uh, uh, most of the noise has been removed from the signal. The same can be uh, verified uh, by having, let's say, uh, let's close all, okay. and let's say we plot the FFT of the filtered signal. Yeah. So most of the noise has been removed, but one of the factor the lower noise was. because it has removed the noise from this clearly but from uh, because uh, the order is specified the transition period transition period means if we have specified our uh, frequency that means the cut off frequency about 5 hertz that means at lower order the roll off factor will not be that much higher so due to which the near uh, uh, exact signal uh, frequency which are near to the cut off frequency will not be filtered out effectively so there are two options either uh, we increase the order but uh, obviously there are certain drawbacks uh, with the increasing the order and uh, uh, if we can keep uh, track of those limitations then we can use the higher order uh, filter so we have created this uh, script and this will be available to download on our website that is jcbrolabs.org so in this we will try to uh, visualize various result with the uh, different orders and 
their effect on the signal frequency. So here uh, our, uh, we have choose a signal of amplitude 2 and uh, order of 20 is being there. So let's first start with order 5. So it will be easy and we have uh, used both the filters in the same script that is IR, uh, IR butterworth filter and FIR filter. Let's run it. So this is a signal with noise and this is the step response uh, of the FIR filter. This is the IR filter and this is for the output signal or the filtered signal of uh, Butterworth filter. And this is the FIR filter response and this is the output of the FIR filter. So right now the noise is less because the amplitude of the input signal was high. It was of two. So if the amplitude is higher, the filter response, filter signal will be in much more good shape. Let's increase the order of the filter by 20. And let's see it. So if you have visualized this one, so there is a sharp, uh, cut, uh, sharp transition from cut off to other reasons and similarly uh, this is starting portion uh, let's go back to the yeah this was the output of the FII uh, the signal at the starting has been lost due to the higher order properties of the filter and same similarly for the FIR case the starting portions have been uh, removed or kind of attenuated by higher degrees. So this is a uh, drawback of using higher order filters. So let's say if we have a 40 order filter and similarly here 40 order filter. Uh, uh, again, these are the uh, this band uh, will increase if we keep on increasing the order of the filter. So there are several other, uh, we can say, design aspects or design techniques of the filter through which we can uh, usually, uh, 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 we can usually remove these uh, drawbacks of the filters uh, for the higher order. Uh, these are the response. So you can try, you can download the source code from MATLAB and you can try and experiment with uh, your own signal or your own, app or your own applications and come up with the uh, some project kind of thing. So I hope you understand in this video, you understand how to design a low pass filter, uh, whether it is an IR or FIR filter in MATLAB and how to use uh, those particular design filter in order to remove the noise from the We celebrate International Women's Day. So that's it for this video. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, before I say anything more, <clears throat> based on watching this one, are there any questions? No, sir. What I want you to do is to be able to use this information to, to you know, and let me use this word reservedly to, you know, play around in MATLAB to see how it is that if you're a giver of certain things, how it is that you, you know, certain, certain parameters, how it is that you can actually do your design using MATLAB. Um, to create filters. I I 
I'm going to show, share something with you again that explains, as I mentioned before, there are different types of uh, categories of uh, filters. You'd have heard presenters <clears throat> you know, spoke about things like Butterworth filter, elliptic filter. I mentioned their Chebyshev filter. So what are all these filters and why it is that they are, and how is it that they are different? So again, I'm going to share something with you guys, but you know, to explain these things, which will help in terms of the process. But <clears throat> you can think about it in the meantime, in terms of if there were any questions, if there were any unfamiliar process that took place in math lab just now that you would not be able to replicate in terms of designing the filters in terms of designing um, filters if you're asked to do specific filters and I'm also going to add one particular um, specific example so given this filter uh, given this, these parameters, how would you design this filter? All right, so think about the questions if, if you don't have one right now while I look um, to post the information I mentioned just now, okay? Okay, sir.
is J omega. And just like with the Z transform, which was defined in terms of a complex variable Z, we can look at the Laplace transform in terms of the S plane. Well, since S is defined naturally in terms of a real and imaginary component, the real part sigma is the coordinate of the real along the real axis, and then J omega it describes the imaginary axis or the vertical axis. Now, if you look at the Laplace transform, you can see that if I replace S by J omega, then I'm going to get the Fourier transform. In other words, I'll get the frequency response by evaluating S when sigma is equal to zero. So if I take H of S, the Laplace transform, and evaluate it on the J omega axis, in other words, when sigma is equal to zero, then I'm going to get the frequency response. And this is analogous to what we have in the z-plane, where if I evaluate the z-transform on the unit circle, then I get the frequency response. So here in the Laplace domain, the J omega axis has the same role as the unit circle does in the z-transform. Now we've seen in the discrete time case that systems described by linear constant coefficient difference equations lead to system functions that are a ratio of polynomials in Z inverse. Well, in the continuous time case, systems described by linear constant coefficient differential equations lead to transfer functions, H of S, that are ratios of polynomials in S. And we'll write that as a sum from K equals zero to M of coefficients BK times s raised to the kth power. And then in the denominator, we'll have a sum from k equals zero to n of ak, s raised to the kth power. So n is the number of derivatives in the output of the system, whereas m is the number of derivatives that are present in the input of the system. So since these are ratios of polynomials, I have the same notions of poles and zeros with the Laplace transform as we did with the Z transform. So I'm going to factor this equation in terms of a product of roots of the numerator and of the denominator. The CKs are the zeros and the DKs, those are going to be the poles of this system. We can take the inverse Laplace transform of this transfer function to find the impulse response and it turns out that this proceeds in a manner similar to the, what we've done with the Z transform in that we're going to use a partial fraction expansion to write this as sum of terms involving each pole in the denominator of those terms. When we take the inverse Laplace transform, each of these poles generates an e to the dk times t u of t response. And I've written the inverse Laplace transform here, assuming that none of the poles are repeated. So this is very insightful because it says that continuous time systems are described in terms of exponential signals, e to the dk t u of t. And we've also assumed here that we're looking for a causal continuous time system. So putting this all together, we readily conclude that if a system is going to be both stable and causal, then these exponential terms need to decay. Because for a system to be stable in continuous time, the impulse response has to be absolutely integrable. So for these to decay, they have to be decaying exponentials, which means the real part of these poles, dk, have to be less than zero. So I have e to the negative sigma k t involved in the impulse response. Well, if the real part of the poles are less than zero, that implies that the poles have to be in the left half of the s-plane. Any poles in the right half of the s-plane cannot be associated with a stable causal system. So just like we had in discrete time that the poles had to be inside the unit circle for the system to be both stable and causal, in continuous time, the poles have to be in the left half of the S-plane for the system to be stable and causal. 
So the way our design procedure works is we're going to start off with a prototype continuous time low pass filter HLP of S. So this is defined in terms of its transfer function involving the variable S, which was sigma plus J omega. So the prototype low pass filter is going to be depend on whether we choose Butterworth, Chebyshev 1, Chebyshev type 2, or elliptical. That will give us different prototype low pass filters. And typically these are chosen so that the half power point or the point where the magnitude response is a square root of 2 over 2 is at omega equals 1 radian per second. So then in the next stage we're going to take our critical frequencies for the discrete time filter that is pass band edges and stop band edges. We're going to take those and we're going to convert those to critical frequencies for a continuous time filter. And this is a stage known as pre-warping because there's a nonlinear relationship here between locations of critical frequencies in discrete time and their corresponding locations in continuous time. That's because of the way we're ultimately going to convert our continuous time filter to a discrete time filter, which will be step four of this procedure. So once I have these critical frequencies, then I'm going to use something called a frequency transformation, which is replacing the variable s by some function of another variable s tilde. And the goal of this frequency transformation is to take our prototype filter and give us a continuous time filter that has these omega k's as its critical frequencies. So the transformation is actually fairly straightforward, and we'll talk about frequency transformations in another lecture. The idea is that I take my low pass prototype filter and everywhere that I have S in the transfer function, I replace that with a function F of S tilde. And that gives me a new transfer function H of S tilde, or correspondingly a new frequency response H of omega tilde, which is dependent on the prototype filter frequency response with omega replaced by F of omega tilde. So at this point, if we've done everything properly, the critical frequencies of this transformed analog filter are in the right locations. And next, we're going to convert from continuous time to discrete time. Most commonly, this is done using the bilinear transform. And the bilinear transform is a relationship between the Laplace variable S and the Z transform variable Z. If we define S tilde to be equal to 2 times 1 minus Z inverse over 1 plus Z inverse, that this transformation has some very desirable properties, which we'll look at in detail in another lecture. So I obtain, finally, my discrete time filter H of Z by taking my frequency transformed analog filter H of S tilde, and everywhere I see S tilde, I substitute 2 times 1 minus Z inverse divided by 1 plus Z inverse. So if H of S tilde is a ratio of polynomials in S tilde, this transformation will result in an H of Z that's a ratio of polynomials in Z inverse, which is exactly the kind of filter that we can implement with the linear constant coefficient difference equation. And then our final step in this process is to verify that our discrete time filter H of Z satisfies the specifications that we desired to meet originally. Because one can make errors along the way here, or in certain cases, if the design is specified too tightly, it turns out that numerical issues can cause you to end up with an H of Z that don't match the original specifications. So this is an overview of how filter design takes place. And if you use MATLAB, this is the procedure that's employed by MATLAB's filter design functions like Butter and Cheb1 and so on. They follow this process to design the filter. To do this, though, if you're going to use a software package, you don't need to understand the details of these steps. You can apply it, and as long as you check the end result that you've got a filter which satisfies your specs, then you're good to go.
All right. Anybody wants to give me a reminder again? What's the difference between a bottle word filter and an elliptical filter? The butter um, is mono, um, mono, something another. Mono not to remember the elliptic. <laughs> what does monolithic mean, though? That, that's for anybody who is here, because that's that's how I want you guys to be able to build up it and, and then get your confidence. It's not about for me. It's not about DSP is not about the maths that, 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 that get you confused. It's a process. So we talk about the two things, the monolithic as compared to ripple. What do I mean by monolithic? Straight, sir, or in this case on the same level. Um... Uh, something like that. Anybody else want All right, monolithic just means that the thing has a smooth decay, it has a smooth decay and not, not, not up and down and changing in, in terms of a ripple, right? Um, as I said, a ripple I means that the thing is pretty much on the same level, but it is fluctuating, it's changing, it doesn't stay at one, um, one level on the same level. All right, so now we know what these are. What's the difference in terms of monolithic, um, sorry, in terms of Butterworth? And again, just uh, just to see if you you, you in, understand what was explained. The difference, the monolith, the Butterworth, and for example, the, the um, Uh, the Chevy Chase, let's say the, 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 the as I said, I think I used the, the um, elliptical before. What, 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 what did you pick up as a big difference? Yes, sir. The ellipse um, has ripples, it has a ripple in its decaying process. Which one? Yes. Elliptic. Elliptic. Elliptic has a ripple in where? Um, when it's decaying. Yes, sir. Um, actually, it, actually, it has it has it in in both the the pass band and the um the stop band. And uh, Butterworth doesn't have it in neither the stop band nor the pass band. Is that correct? Mr. Torp. Is that correct? I, I'm I'm listening to your colleagues, you know. Because <laughs> remember, you know, that's what I was that's so that why I do. I wanted to watch a video. Not just to watch it that past that. So I was who who actually watched it. Because remember I said that I was gonna present something that explained these things because going forward, you're gonna be using these, you're gonna be using them, you're gonna be having an understanding as to why we're we using these. These are um, Butterworth or elliptical or Chevy Chase in the design process. So who who wants to tell us again? Or Andre, I want to go back and share just that little first part, the first two or three minutes of the other of the thing. Make no I think, the, I think the, the um the Butterworth more elliptic and in both parts and stop buns. Ah. Uh. Now, why is the elliptical uh, more efficient? 
both these, of course, we're, both, we're looking at both low pass filters. It could be a high pass, just the same. But why is it the, the elliptical is more efficient um, as compared to the others? Is it that it have a faster decay? Absolutely. So what happens is that there's a it gives you a, a, a more sharp um def defined stop band and pass band. So you do not have it gradually or um, tapering off. But you basically have it, even though it has ripples, it basically tapers off almost like instantaneously if you're thinking about time. So it, there's a clear demarcation between the 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 stop band and the pass band for the elliptical um, filter. Am I clear? Yes. All right. So we can actually go back to it whenever you wish. It's posted. All right. And one last video, which this is the one I want to pay a lot of attention to. Because as I said before, I'm going to show you one that actually have some form of, it goes through the process of helping you in MATLAB with the various toolbox and library as a how to design filters. All right specific filters. So one last one coming up. I post it and then ask Andre to share it. All right. To play. It. Yes, sir.
All right, Andre, when you're ready, you can take it away. Is a presidential road trip. Andre, are you still? Hi, viewers. Welcome to Electrical Lectures YouTube channel. In this video, I will be telling you the method to design FIR and IIR filter with different parameters by using filter designer tool, which we previously called FDA tool in the previous versions of MATLAB. I have already explained several differences between FIR and IIR filters in my previous DSP video. In this video, we will be focusing on how to design effectively the FIR and IER filters of various kinds and export them by using MATLAB code or using objects. So first of all, I will be telling you how to open the graphical user interface or GUI to design the filters. In previous versions, this tool was called FDA tool, but now its name has been changed in the newer versions of MATLAB, I am using MATLAB 2019A. So here, the name of this tool is now Filter Designer. So I just type here Filter Designer and enter, and MATLAB will open the tool. So this is the main interface of FDA tool or Filter Designer tool. You have got several types and several options in this interface. Let us start from the response type. Here, you will select which type of filter you are going to design in terms of frequency response. So we have got five options here. The first one is low pass and inside this low pass, you can also select any other, any other type. All these types are low pass, but having different characteristics. The second one is high pass. Again, you have got three subtypes here. Third one is band pass. Next is band stop. And the last one is differentiator in which there are other specific types of filters which are not usually counted as the main four types, including differentiator, multiband, Hilbert, and etc. So let's suppose we are going to design low pass filter. So I have selected this low pass, and this is basically the default selection given by MATLAB. The next option below response type is the design method. So here we will be selecting the type of design that we are going to choose. The two options include FIR and IAR. Inside each option, you have got several other options as well, which correspond to the prototype filter that MATLAB will use to design the filter. The, these prototypes include Butterworth, Chebyshev Type 1, Type 2, elliptic filters, and others. So you have to select suitable type from this drop down list. Usually, we opt for equiripple filter, and it is also the default selection. In case of IAR filter, you have got direct the names of those prototypes because while designing an FIR filter, you always start by designing IAR filter. So MATLAB adopts the same algorithm. It uses a specific prototype and designs an IAR filter and then transforms that IAR filter by using windowing method to design FIR filter. So anyways, if you are going to design FIR filter, you will select a suitable type from this drop down list. And if you are going to design IIR filter, then you will select suitable type from these options. Usually, again, we go for Butterworth unless we have to design a specific filter. The next option is filter order. We have got two options here. The first one is specify order and the other one is minimum order. So with the given specifications on the right hand side, MATLAB tries to design the filter with minimum possible order. And with the first option, if you want to specify the order yourself, then you have to select this option and supply a number over here. Like by default, 10 is written over here. You can write any whole number here, which will specify the order. By using minimum order, MATLAB will restrict the order of the filter to minimum possible. This is usually a better option if you are going to design a filter that needs to be implemented in some hardware platform then definitely you need to have minimum order and you have to select this option. The next option is density factor. 20 is written over here. 
and usually this factor works well for the design of the filter. Now on the right hand side, you have got the main specifications area. They include two types. The first one is frequency specifications and the other one is magnitude specifications. So first, let us go through frequency specifications. In the first drop down list, you have got units option. If you have your specifications in discrete frequency or in radians, then you need to select normalized 0 to 1 from this option. You see, when I have selected this, the sampling frequency option is already disabled, which means the specifications are already in the discrete frequency. So you do not need to specify the frequency. This is usually the easiest option if you don't have any idea regarding the sampling frequency. But if you have got the sampling frequency, then you need to select the other options. So if you are given the specifications in discrete frequency, then you have to supply the passband and stop band frequency between 0 to 1. So these numbers need to be replaced. And I will write here, for example, 0 0.2 is my passband frequency and 0 0.3 is my stop band frequency. Next one is magnitude specification. There are two options in the units category. You can select dBs or you can select linear. Usually we prefer dBs and inside these options you have got passband attenuation denoted by A pass and stop band attenuation which is A stop. The default values are 1 and 80 for both the passband and stop band respectively but you can modify these values as per your specifications. Now once all these values are selected now you have to click on this option which is design filter. So you see this is the magnitude response of our design filter and as you can see 0 0.2 pi radians per sample because the value was you have specified was 0 0.2 and it was normalized with pi so it is actually 0 0.2 pi so 0 0.2 pi is the pass band and 0 0.3 pi is the stop band and matlab has designed the filter having order of 50 you see this is the minimum order over which MATLAB is able to satisfy these specifications of the prescribed filter. Now let us change the frequency specifications to other options. Let's say I select kilohertz from here. When I select kilohertz, you see FS is now enabled. So now we need to write the value of sampling frequency in this box. And remember, you need to specify the sampling frequency by keeping one important point in mind. And that is the sampling frequency must be same as the sampling frequency of the data which you are going to filter by using this design filter. So let's say in our case it is 48,000. Let me change it to let's say 10. So it is 10 kilohertz and now the pass band and stop band frequency also in kilohertz. There is one important point that you need to consider over here that both the pass band and stop band frequencies must satisfy Nyquist criteria. Of the sampling frequency. So if the sampling frequency is 10 kilohertz, then maximum frequency uh, that we can write here is 5 kilohertz as per Nyquist criteria. So for example, I write 2 kilohertz here and 3 kilohertz here. So it will satisfy the Nyquist criteria. Now I click again the design filter and you see the x axis is now changed to kilohertz and 2 kilohertz is the passband frequency, 3 kilohertz is the stop band frequency. And you see the order is now changed. It is now 25. So it is the minimum order which MATLAB uh, could find to design this filter. Similarly, you go for other options as well. If you are going to design an IAR filter, simply go over here, design method, you select IAR filter, and Butterworth is automatically selected. And now this option is now changed. Here, now it is written match exactly. So you have two options. Either you can match stop band or pass band exactly. In the other one, you will experience ripples because it is Butterworth filter. Now with the same specifications, I will click design filter. And you see, this is the design filter by using Butterworth prototype. Now once the filter is designed, you can examine various features and parameters corresponding to this particular filter. To visualize all those parameters, you have to go in this bar. Currently, we have selected magnitude response. The next one is phase response. If you select this phase response, phase response of the filter is plotted. Here is another object named H.2. 
and it was normalized with pi. So it is actually 0.2 pi. So 0.2 pi is the pass band and 0.3 pi is the stop band and MATLAB has designed the filter having order of 50. You see, this is the minimum order over which MATLAB is able to satisfy these specifications of the prescribed filter. Now let us change the frequency specifications to other options. Let's say I select kilohertz from here. When I select kilohertz, you see FS is now enabled. So now we need to write the value of sampling frequency in this box. And remember, you need to specify the sampling frequency by keeping one important point in mind. And that is the sampling frequency must be same as the sampling frequency of the data which you are going to filter by using this design filter. So let's say in our case, it is 48,000. Let me change it to, let's say, 10. So it is 10 kilohertz. And now the pass band and stop band frequency also in kilohertz. There is one important point that you need to consider over here that both the pass band and stop band frequencies must satisfy Nyquist criteria of the sampling frequency. So if the sampling frequency is 10 kilohertz, then maximum frequency uh, that we can write here is 5 kilohertz as per Nyquist criteria. So for example, I write 2 kilohertz here and 3 kilohertz here. So it will satisfy the Nyquist criteria. Now I click again the design filter. And you see the x-axis is now changed to kilohertz and 2 kilohertz is the passband frequency. 3 kilohertz is the stop band frequency. And you see the order is now changed. It is now 25. So it is the minimum order which MATLAB uh, could find to design this filter. Similarly, you go for other options as well. If you are going to design an IAR filter, simply go over here, design method, you select IAR filter, and Butterworth is automatically selected. And now this option is now changed. Here, now it is written match exactly. So you have two options. Either you can match stop band or pass band exactly. In the other one, you will experience ripples because it is Butterworth filter. Now with the same specifications, I will click design filter. And you see, this is the design filter by using Butterworth prototype. Now once the filter is designed, you can examine various features and parameters corresponding to this particular filter. To visualize all those parameters, you have to go in this bar. Currently, we have selected magnitude response. The next one is phase response. If you select this phase response, phase response of the filter is plotted. The next one is phase and magnitude combined. So you see both are combined on the same plot. The next one is the group delay response. So this is the group delay of this particular filter. The next one is phase delay. The next one is impulse response. This is very important. When you design a filter, you need to visualize the impulse response. And since we have designed an IAR filter, so you can see that impulse response is having length containing large number of samples. And theoretically, it contains infinite number of samples. The next one is step response. And because you, are, you have designed IAR filter, so it is very necessary to go through the pole zero plot in order to examine the stability of the system. So next one is the pole zero plot. So you see all the poles are lying inside the unit circle, which means that your filter is stable. So this pole zero plot is very significant and mandatory to examine so that you may know the stability analysis of your system. The next one is the values of numerator and denominator. MATLAB designs a filter by using second order sections by default. So you see in this window, the first one is section one containing three values for numerator, three for denominator, then section two and so on up to the last one is section eight. So since the design filter was of the order 16, so the total number of sections is eight. So it has designed by using eight second order sections cascaded with each other. Now, the last portion of my video is how to export this design filter. So you have got a couple of options to export this filter. If you want to uh, export it as a MATLAB code, then go into the file and just click generate MATLAB code. 
and here it is written filter design function. You simply click on this option and it will ask you to save the corresponding M file into your directory. So let's suppose we save it into, into the MATLAB folder and name it as test filter and press enter. So you see it has made a function named test filter and all the parameters and the corresponding MATLAB code is over here. You simply need to run this code and you will get the filter structure in your workspace. I have run this code. Name of the variable is answer. You can save it by your desired name. For example, I save it like HD is equal to answer. So that is how. Now this HD is your filter structure. This was the first method of how to export. And now the second method, go again to the filter designer tool and click file. And from here, click export. When you click export, you will see another window in which you have got several options. The first one is export to workspace. You have got other options also. If you are going to export it to workspace, keep it as it is. The second one is export type. So by default, it is written coefficients over here. You can select objects as well. Usually we go for objects and then the name of the filter. So for example, we name it as HD underscore two. So here is another object named HD underscore two. Now you have already exported the filter into the uh, MATLAB workspace. If I want to simply um, filter, let's say a sequence of ones, just to show you how to use these objects to filter your data. So let's say I make an input data, which is ones, one comma thousand. In order to filter, I will simply write y is equal to filter hd comma x. So this data is successfully filtered. And if you want to see how both the uh, input and the output look like, you can use the plot function. So let me plot both of them in single figure. First, I will plot x. This is the input, which was all ones. And if I use hold on here and plot the output as well. Equities, also known as stocks, is a final. So you see, this is the output. So this blue one is the input, which is all ones, and the red one is the output. So this is how you can design filters in MATLAB by using Filter Designer tool, and how to export them, how to visualize them, and how to use them to filter your data. Andre. Thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to subscribe our channel, Electrical Lectures. Yes, sir. All right, we can we can stop it there. And my my question, as always, after watching the video, what's the